Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's show, host Casey Hinches is using natural plant materials to dye Easter eggs. We also plant a living Easter basket using ryegrass. In Oklahoma City, we visit the Myriad Botanical Gardens, and Casey is in our new fruit orchard to prune the nectarine tree that we planted last year. Been on the internet and looked up how to dye Easter eggs, everyone has recommendations on what to use for natural dyes. We recently did our own little research here in the studio and figured out what dyes work best and which ones maybe weren't so good and we wanted to share that information with you. As you can see we've been dyeing quite a few eggs and we've got some really colorful ones that we were pleased with and I wanted to show some of those with you. Now we used vegetables and spices um, on the vegetables, what we did was we used four cups of water to four cups of vegetable, and then we added two tablespoons of vinegar, and we let that boil for 30 minutes. When we strained that off, then that's what gave us our dyes. Now on our spices, we used four cups of water to four tablespoons of spice, and again added two tablespoons of vinegar, and that is what gave us our dye for our spices. So here you can see one of our top winners was turmeric. And now you have to be careful and you wanna make sure to wear gloves um, and you can just see from our tongs that turmeric really did a number. So it will dye more than just your eggs. But on the white eggs, we got kind of a brighter yellow and then on the brown eggs, we got more of a golden brown yellow color. Um, this was also depending on the length of time or whether it was 30 minutes or 24 hours. The orange colors came from chili and paprika. And then we used grape juice, which gave us some really nice color on our white egg after 30 minutes. And then also setting a white egg and a brown egg in the grape juice for 24 hours kind of gave us a crystallized effect on the shell. Now all of these eggs were hard boiled prior to dyeing them. So they are edible in that fact, um, but this kind of really gave us almost like a geode rock sort of look to it. This beautiful greenish blue color came because we used cabbage. The dark color was on a 24 hour brown egg, and then we got this nice robin blue on a white egg that was only in the dye for about 30 minutes. On our red and our yellow onion skins, we got beautiful shades of red and orange, you can see here. Now one that might really stand out that probably is one that you won't wanna eat is this really dark brown one. And that egg, we actually boiled a raw egg in the onion skin, the red onion skin for 30 minutes. So it might be a little overcooked. Next you can see we have this beautiful shade of pink and that came from using four cups of beet. With the beet, it had a beautiful bright pink color, but when we washed the egg, we did unfortunately lose a lot of that pink color. Then we got into more of our berries. Here we have our blueberries that gave us a beautiful shade of blue, and then we also have some blackberries and raspberries to follow that up. Finally, we got into coffee and cumin and chamomile tea to give us these different shades of yellow and brown. So you can see we have a, quite a range of color that came from our dyes. Now we had a couple of dyes that we tried and we had read that would work, but we weren't too impressed with them. And those are the hibiscus tea, the cayenne, and also the spinach. We just didn't really get much color for the effort to do those. So I wouldn't recommend those. 
Now, if you've been to buy dye kits at your local store, you know that dyeing Easter eggs isn't enough anymore. They have all these themes and things that you can add to your dyed Easter eggs. In fact, we did find a kit for natural colored yeah, Easter eggs, and these are the four colors that we got from that. So it is nice having a kit, but I will say you get a lot more variety in your color when you try it yourself. And this kit even came with a botanical theme where it had included stickers that you could add to your eggs before you dye them. So in keeping with that theme, we went to the grocery store and got some herbs out of the uh, vegetable section. And this was cilantro that we put in pantyhose. Um, and you can see how it died and left the area where the cilantro was covering the egg. So this is what we did. We got the egg, we added cilantro to the outside of the egg, and it helps if you put a little water. It allows that leaf to really stick to the egg a bit better. And then just wrap the pantyhose around it and then place that in your chosen dye color that you want to use. Here we have a few that we are going to reveal. And this is the real fun of it because you never know exactly what color you're going to get um, or how it's going to look. This was one that we used in red onion skin. And you can see the cilantro has left beautiful leaves on those. Here was dill that we used in turmeric. We were kind of experimenting a little bit with the herbs, uh, but it seemed that cilantro did the best. You can see there's quite a bit of turmeric powder still on this, and that's why we want to rinse these when we're done with them. Now, the other thing that you can do to really give your eggs a final gloss is to use some olive oil on them. It's basically like putting water on marble. It really just enhances the color. Uh, it is edible, of course, so we're not worried about that. But it just kind of brings out that color and makes it a little bit richer. So we never know what the weather is going to hold when Easter comes. It might be a beautiful spring day and you enjoy your garden, but if not, and we get spring showers with a little preparation and just a little bit of cleanup, you can have hours of fun. Whether you're dyeing Easter eggs naturally or using the more artificial kind, it's nice to decorate for Easter. And you can do that outside or inside by giving some containers. Now, if you want to do outside, sometimes your containers might look a little dreary at this point. And so you can jazz them up by doing the same thing that we're going to show you here. Indoors, you might want to find a container that doesn't have holes in it. Really, any container will work. Um, shallow containers work. You only just need a couple of inches. We have a couple of examples of different containers here. This is a nice glass basket that you can use. But I particularly liked this one that was burlap and chicken wire to kind of keep with the, the egg theme. I found these at just a local feed store, but you can also find them at a hobby store or like I said, you might have something laying around your house to use. What we're going to do is create a living grass basket and we're going to start this by filling it with potting soil. Now you want to make sure that you're using potting soil, not regular topsoil because potting soil allows for more consistent moisture throughout the rooting zone and also it's not as heavy. So therefore, those roots will be able to grow much easier. Now, we've pre-wet our potting soil because sometimes it can be a little hard to get it wet initially. So we're just going to fill up this basket with our potting soil. You want to make sure to leave a couple of inches or about an inch um, so that when we do water it, it doesn't wash the soil out of the container. Now the nice thing about pre-wetting this is we know that all that soil is moist but we're not sitting in a pool of water down at the bottom of it. The nice thing about glass containers is you can see exactly when you need to water it because again they don't have holes in it so you don't necessarily want a lot of water sitting in the bottom of that container. What we're going to do next is put our rye seed. Now, this is just regular grass, rye grass seed that you'll buy. 
Now, a lot of times when we talk about ryegrass seed, we recommend that you use perennial ryegrass because it tends to have a denser stand of turf grass and it also is a darker green. But for this purpose, it's kind of a temporary project um, and annual ryegrass is a very vigorous grower. Um, but one of the biggest factors is that it's cheaper. So go ahead and use just annual ryegrass and we're gonna sprinkle that in pretty thick there on the soil surface. Now ryegrass germinates pretty quickly. This will actually grow in just a matter of a few days. You'll start to see it sprout up. We're gonna then just kind of pat that grass in, that grass seed in a little bit. And you can't overdo the seed right now because you want a nice stand of grass. So that's about all we need to do. We can water this in just a touch more to wet that seed, um, but the soil is wet. You can see we've done a galvanized tub right here. We did this just a couple of days ago and we already have grass seed that's starting to sprout. The other thing you can do after you've seeded your soil is just get some saran wrap and cover it and that will help retain that moisture in there until your seed starts to germinate. So you might consider doing this about a week before Easter and you'll have a nice stand of grass. The last thing you need to do is just add that finishing touch of the Easter eggs. This season we've taken a look at several city parks in the Oklahoma City metropolitan area. And today we're at one of the most beautiful here at the Myriad Gardens in downtown Oklahoma City. It's 15 acres of botanical interest. And joining us is Maureen Heffernan, the executive director here. And today we're specifically talking about the seasonal plant tours that you guys offer. Now these aren't just any normal tours. Can you They're tell us They're not about only But first, I wanted to welcome you back, <laughs> Thank Casey. You, you are part of the place. reason why this is so beautiful. <laughs> and you, you were our director of horticulture, so welcome back to the garden that you helped start here. Thank you. And we Thank appreciate you. that. But yes, our walking tours are wonderful. Actually, it's really interesting. The person who, whose idea this was is Kelly Barnes, who used to be a development director here. She's now at the Oklahoma City Community Foundation. And as someone who worked here, she'd be in the gardens a lot and didn't know anything about plants. Said, oh, I'd love to go on a walking tour and learn, learn more. So it's kind of interesting how that got started. And then the Oklahoma City Community Foundation, which has been a very good friend to us, funding some wonderful projects that we couldn't do without their support, uh, one being the walking tour. And we offer that free the last Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. Or you can get a self-guided tour here in our visitor lobby or online there's information. But it's great. It's about an hour. You can come by. There's no charge. And one of our volunteers, our horse staff, will uh, walk around the grounds and point out uh, we have a couple of different themes. The current one is summer, okay. of course. So they're so, seasonal. They're you seasonal. Have, the plants change, so, you know, through the season, so you have seasonal tours. Absolutely. Yeah. Plants change. We have our, the theme for the summer is uh, color and water conservation. Okay. And our director of education, Ann Fleener, helped create this and write everything up. She does some of them, our horse staff and our volunteers. And they're a great way to walk around, learn about plants, uh, if you can't make it to one of these, we also have just about all of our plants are labeled too. So the Myriad Gardens is wonderful to come see plants that thrive in this area, that do well in our tough conditions. The plants are labeled, so it's a great outdoor classroom. And you have one of the maps with you. These are available in the visitor center. And so this is what, if you wanted to go on a self-guided, you could pick one of these up and find your way. Absolutely, and we can give these away free, again, with thanks to the Oklahoma City Community Foundation. They help fund uh, the printing of these for people to have. And it looks like there's about 15 plants on here. How did your staff kind of choose which plants to include? There's so many beautiful plants out here. I know, here. it's like trying to pick your favorite child. <laughs> but it's, it was a combination of things that we had, but the staff, Ann and Nate, worked together to think about some other plants to include that would be very good um, uh, plants that uh, people might like for the color, for their uh, drought resistance, hardiness. So some were already here and then some they, uh, they curated back into it because they're, they're good plants for people to know about. Well, we've got a few of those plants behind us here with the liatris. And mm -hmm. so these are some of those plants that are more drought tolerant. 
Yes, this is our prairie garden. As you know, Casey, you helped to plant it and plant it. So this is I, one of my favorite gardens here. It's, it's a wild garden, so you kind of have to change your perception about what a garden should look like. Right. But we wanted a prairie garden because this really showcases the genius of Oklahoma um, uh, landscapes, the wild landscape, this beautiful prairie. So we have recreated that for the city and just about everything you see here from the grasses, the blue stems, to the asters, to cone flowers, to Mexican feather grass, uh, turtle plant, they're all drought resistant. In fact, they don't want to be overwatered. Right. And I know one of the reasons why we installed the prairie is because there's so many tourists that come to Oklahoma City mm -hmm. and don't get ex to experience the prairie that's in Oklahoma. I know. I mean, no, we, they don't want an English garden here. Right. We, and, and just look, standing here, looking at the wind blow over this, um, it really gives that feeling of, oh, OK, I'm in Oklahoma now. I'm yeah. not in some other place or region. So it's been very popular. and. The other wonderful thing about a garden like this is not only the color, the drought resistance, the hardiness, but this is a pollinator haven mm -hmm. here. So the pollinators, this is an oasis. It's, so it's, it's a great outdoor classroom to learn about plants and pollinators and the interactions. Well, let's go take a look at some other plants that are on this tour. Great. So Maureen, I know this was funded through the Oklahoma City Community Foundation, mm -hmm. and one of their initiatives is to activate spaces. So. Mm -hmm. We've actually walked about half a mile when you do this whole tour. You, you do certainly do. You can walk more than that, but certainly if you do the whole tour, it's at least about a half a mile. So that gets you going, calms you down, relaxes <laughs> you. It's, it's great on a whole uh, number of levels. Yeah. And in addition, they've funded other wellness programs here. We have exercise, biking, dancing, Zumba. So go to our website, look at all the things you can do here. Well, we've got a few plants that are on this tour. We've got our Mexican feather grass. Mm -hmm and our red yucca, which is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. I know this is one of our number one most asked about plants all the time. This is a gorgeous plant, and it, it just seems to, to, the color pops, it looks good with everything. It's tough, it's drought tolerant. It's a great plant, the red yucca. And it looks like the Russian sage is also, what's nice about these maps is mm -hmm. if you're doing a self-guided, it's got a little mm -hmm. description on mm -hmm. here, so. Now, Russian sage to me is, is such a lovely, beautiful, uh, romantic type plant. It's just kind of this, blue cloud of color, very soft and lovely. And it's a, it's a great plant that can calm hot colors too. So it's wonderful with reds and yellows, it pops, but it's just beautiful on its own. It's tough, it's easy to care for. It's a wonderful plant for gardeners in Oklahoma. Well, again, you know, we mentioned that it's a nice benefit to have these tours for exercise and also mm -hmm. to learn more about plants. Mm -hmm. Great for business people who might be on a lunch break to come down or if you have visitors in from out of town to bring them down and tour them. Again, where mm -hmm. can they get maps like this? They can get this map in our visitor lobby, which is at the south end of the Crystal Bridge. Uh, there should be some information online. And again, people are welcome. Come out on the last Saturday of every month, year round. There's a, a, a walking tour, which you'll greatly enjoy. Um, all the plants you see, you'll learn a lot more about if you come on the tour. And a big thanks to the Oklahoma City Community Foundation for helping to sponsor this. And Absolutely. And I have to say, one other project they're helping us with is a new shade garden, which we'll be building this summer. It'll open in October. So do come back and do a story that, on a that good, or come and see it. That's a good teaser. We will mm -hmm. definitely be back. Thank you for right. joining us. Well, thanks for being here. Oklahoma Gardening would like to thank the Oklahoma City Community Foundation for the work that it does throughout Oklahoma and its support of our program. Since 1969, the Oklahoma City Community Foundation has worked with donors to create charitable funds and bring together and empower partnerships that benefit our community, both now and into the future. For more information about programs and opportunities for giving, visit the Foundation's website, OCCF.org. If you remember last spring, I planted a nectarine whip, which basically means it was a young, thin little tree that we planted. It was bare root, and at the time it was probably about four feet tall, but I did something that might have seemed a little drastic. I cut it completely in half, and I cut it back to about 18 inches in height. You can see where that wound is to this day, um, but actually the reason why we cut it back was because nectarines, apricots, 
um, plums and also peach trees, you want to train and prune them into what is called an open center method. So you can see our tree performed just how we had hoped. Um, the center uh, leader, basically, when we cut it, it allowed those other branches to start growing. So now we're in our second season and it's time to look at our tree again and identify the scaffolds. Scaffolds are three to five branches that we want to choose to have that more open vase-like uh, canopy. So you can see here we have three primary branches that have grown out. Two of these are pretty good scaffolds. This third one, it's kind of grown almost upright. It's kind of filled that leader role and has gone more vertical than horizontal. Ideally, you want your scaffolds to be 45 to 60 degrees angle um, from the trunk of the tree. Any shallower than that, they would potentially break and snap as you get more weight on the branch, um, either with ice or snow or with the fruit load. Anything greater than that, it would be too low. You don't want to choose a scaffold that is lower than 12 inches. So some of these smaller ones, they would not make ideal scaffolds. So here we have three that we're looking at. The other thing you ideally would want is for your scaffolds to be four inches apart. Now, of course, nature gives you what it gives you. And so this is what we're working with. We're going to choose this branch here and then also this branch here as two of our scaffolds. Now on the back side here, you can see there's a smaller branch that is growing that has a nice angle to it. So I think we're gonna choose that one as well as our scaffold. Again, this is a significant amount of the tree, um, but this is training the tree. And there's probably not any one right answer. You just kind of follow these general rules. Um, and the, the point is, is to continue to maintain and train this tree. So we're gonna train this branch here to be our third scaffold. So we've got this one here, this one. Now all of that energy is gonna go into causing it to grow. And then we have this one as our third one here. Now, again, to keep this open center method, we need to trim anything that's growing towards the center. So we're gonna use our smaller hand pruners and take off some of this other stuff. The other thing is that these smaller branches that are down lower, we're gonna remove those as well. You can see here we've got our three good scaffolds and this smaller one will continue to grow. Um, we've got an open center canopy here and this will allow that sunlight to penetrate down into the canopy encouraging more fruiting on the tree as well as it'll improve the air circulation that will decrease the disease and insect population in our tree. Now, right now, the angles are good. And that's the other thing we want to look at on scaffolds is the angle. Like I said, they want to be 45 to 60 degrees away from the trunk of the tree. And you can improve this a little bit by using a couple of things. You can make spacers that you can use to push them uh, apart. You can buy commercial ones or you can make them. You can also use things that you might have around the house. Now for something that's this small, a paper clip or a clothesline clip will work. And at this point, the angle is pretty good, but we're gonna wanna ensure that it stays growing at this angle. And since we've removed the interior, this might wanna start growing more vertically and become a new leader. So we're gonna put this clothesline clip weighted to a brick just to encourage it to continue to grow a little bit more at a horizontal angle. The other thing you can use is a couple of bricks that are tied together and some pantyhose um, to encourage this one to continue to grow out a little bit. We're just gonna tie some pantyhose around here. I like using pantyhose because they're readily available, they're cheap, and they don't tend to wear on the trees quite as bad as say twine does. So again, with plums, apricots, peaches and nectarine trees, you want to train and prune them into an open center method. 
as you can see here, and select about three to five scaffolds that are at an angle of 45 to 60 degrees off the trunk of the tree. So we've done that here. We've cleaned out the center, any branches that are growing towards the center. Um, we've got good angles on them, and at this point, we'll allow it to continue to grow this season. It is still in training, so we're gonna continue to check back in on it. But for more information on how to prune your fruit trees, check out this fact sheet. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we will give our sedums a trim. Casey will have the top five vegetables for beginners. We tackle cedar rust, and we will have chickens. Lots and lots of chickens. So join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.